Destiny. I Do I even need to say anything? This game is one of the worst games I've ever played. It takes a lot for me to hate a game. If a game is frustrating, it makes you want to end it all, then I hate it. And I won't play. If a game is boring, then I just won't play. Like Overwatch. I hate that game. But I can't say it's boring. Oh, we see nine. Oh, oh. I will actually smash my monitor right now. I will actually fucking smash my monitor right now. I am so However, I've never had a game that I hate so much and yet find so boring like Destiny. I've been playing Destiny since Destiny 2 Vanilla. Since the launch of Destiny 2, I've played all the DLC, excluding Beyond Light at launch, and I have over 3,000 hours on console and PC combined. And I've gone through its ups and downs for almost six years now. However, with the most recent season, I've come to the conclusion that I have no more passion and faith in this franchise. The story sucks, the activities are boring, I believe that this is due to Bungie's inconsistency of quality and care that they put into updates. Because when Bungie puts effort into their updates, they can be really good. So that begs the question, is Bungie purposefully putting less effort into Destiny, or are they just incompetent, like every other studio? That's why I'm making this video. This video is going to be a sort of retrospective slash review on all the major updates to Destiny 2 since the launch to figure out if Bungie is seriously trying with their updates or if they don't care because they know they'll make money either way. Also as a disclaimer, I will not be talking about the microtransactions of the game, such as the Eververse store. As TechCross has a video all about that stuff, if you're interested, this video is purely about the gameplay and the content itself and not the microtransactions around it. I will also be using footage from other people throughout this video because I can't really go back in time to record footage. Anyways, let's start with launch, Destiny 2, aka Destiny 2 Vanilla. Destiny 2 released on September 6th, 2017 for $60. The game launched with a new campaign, a new tower, as well as many new locations like Nessus, Io, Titan, and the EDZ. It also launched with 5 new strikes, 11 crucible maps, 18 exotic weapons, 33 exotic armor, and a new raid. Now on the surface, it seems like a lot of content, but it's not as much as you would think. Firstly, the campaign was pretty bad. I'm not going to talk about the story, because there is nothing to say. It was just a generic and boring campaign from start to finish. No mission really stood out apart from the first and the last mission. The farm was an interesting tower reskin, it gave a fresh new feel to a new hub world than the OG tower, but it didn't matter because at the end of the campaign they just gave you a new tower, so the farm is pointless. The new destinations were cool, but there was nothing really to do in them besides the public events and lost sectors. Well, what about the strikes? Well, there were only five at launch, if you don't count the one that was PlayStation exclusive for some reason. Well, space was only 200, so you run out of space in like two months. There was no lore log in the game, so you either had to watch videos about someone else talking about the lore, or read the lore on certain weapons. Speaking of weapons, all weapon rolls were completely static, meaning that no matter how many times you got a weapon, it would always have the same roll. What's that? You got a weapon and you like how it feels or sounds to use? Well too bad, it's got a shit roll so you can't use it. It's also the opposite effect, for weapons that had a god roll, you would see everyone use them meaning that there was little variety. Kinda defeats the whole point of grinding and loot, when all you have to do is just get the weapon once, and that's it. There's no real replayability, because if you were to do a strike and you want a specific weapon, you would just get that weapon, and you would just not have to worry because it's already a god roll. Another problem was once you completed the campaign, it felt like you were already in the endgame. After only like six hours of playtime, once you finished the campaign, it felt like the only really content you had left to do was the raid in Nightfalls. Which I mean, the Leviathan raid was pretty good. Still probably one of my favorite raids, but as the only real endgame content, it was really boring after the fifth completion. And the Nightfalls were also boring because as mentioned before, there were only five strikes. Meaning that eventually it would get boring due to lack of variety. There was also Trials which came out soon after launch. It was good for the time, but it's overall brought down by the state of PvP at launch. Basically, for those who weren't around at the time, Bungie decided to focus the PvP more on gunplay rather than the abilities and movement. I mean, just look at this gameplay. Does this look fun? They did change this after the fans complained in the Go Fast update, which came out almost 8 months after launch. But hey, it's better than nothing. So, that was really it. You only really had Nightfalls, 
the raid, and some exotic missions or some quests on the different destinations. That was really your only endgame content. Now there was some good stuff. It wasn't all bad. The gunplay was fun. There was a decent amount of stuff to do for like two weeks. And plus, hey, Kate was kind of funny sometimes. What, may we ask, were you going to do with a Vex teleporter? Get up close and personal with go. Put a bullet in his head. Then maybe eat a sandwich. If we have to die, at least we'll die in the shadow of the Traveler, old friend. We're about to die and you're still making speeches? Sometimes. Even so, the game launched in a bad state. Boring story, lack of endgame content, and bad systems just made this launch just such a dud for many players. So what happened? Was it Bungie's fault that the game launched the way it did? Or was it Activision forcing Bungie to release the game ahead of schedule and implement the changes that were made? Well, according to Bungie's communications director, David DeGue, after Bungie separated from Activision in 2019, quote, I don't know. I think we need to dispel the notion that Activision was some prohibitive overlord that wasn't letting us do awesome things. We launched this franchise with Activision. Naturally, and over the course of time, we both decided we had different goals for what we wanted it to be. So we both went our separate ways. It was amicable, and here we are making this game on our own, doing what we think we need to do to make it awesome. So who knows? Maybe it really was Bungie's fault that Destiny 2 launched the way it did. Or maybe Activision were the ones to suggest changes like the static weapon rolls and rushing Bungie to make a tight release. Well, we may never know. At the end of the day, Destiny 2's launch was lackluster, even if it was or wasn't Bungie's fault. But don't worry! Bungie said they were supplying post-release content at a quicker rate than Destiny 1, and they would be getting help for the post-release content from Vicarious Visions, Senior Software Director Thomas Garries, sorry if I said that wrong, for Destiny 2 PC and a co-developer of Vicarious Visions, said that the team is developing the content by asking itself, quote, How can we build a game that provides this avenue for players to re-engage more frequently, without feeling like they're just bored of the content? The CEO of Activision Publishing, Eric Hirschberg, also said this during a quarter one earnings call for 2017. Quote, The most important thing for this franchise beyond delivering a great game, which Destiny 2 is definitely going to do, as we talked about in the past, is getting the content pipeline right. Destiny's engagement has been the best in Activision's history, and we now have a lot of confidence that we're going to be able to keep up with demand with that steady stream of great content to sort of keep pace with our players' engagement post the release of Destiny 2. The new expansion is coming out soon, and only two months after launch, we're finally going to have some new content to play. New story missions, destination, and exotics? This is going to be great! Oh boy. After a very epic CG cutscene, the story starts with Ikora telling your guardian that she got intel that a damaged ghost belonging to her former mentor Osiris was found on Mercury. She sends the Guardian, where they discover a gateway to the Infinite Forest, a simulated universe created by the Vex. The Guardian then enters the Infinite Forest using a Vex device to place the damaged ghost programming into their own ghost so they can travel inside. The ghost's name is Segura, by the way. I probably should have mentioned that. While inside the Infinite Forest, the Guardian is confronted with a vision of a dark future, where Panoptes and the Vex win and all life is wiped out. After finding a map to Panoptes' lair, we go back to the moment that led to Panoptes' run time forward and use that data to find its location in the present. In a few series of unfortunate events, Panoptes is destroyed with the help of Osiris. Ikora invites Osiris to return to the city, but he declines and goes back into the Infinite Forest to continue to fight the Vex. The pathway to the forest will be open if you ever need to find me. Come, little light. We have infinite realities to explore and all the time in the world. <sighs> wow, that was... something. This expansion was probably the most difficult part to write about for this video, as I'm kind of conflicted on whether this expansion was complete trash, or just kind of meh. On one hand, the campaign was one of the most boring campaigns I have ever played, and on the other hand, we did get more content to play. Now whether that content was good, I'll get into in a second. Let's just start with the campaign first. Number one, the campaign is boring. The campaign takes only like two hours to beat, even with eight missions, and I seriously don't remember anything about them. 
Maybe it's because it's been years since I last played it, or maybe because my Alzheimer's is growing, but from what I remember, this campaign was pretty meh. I remember being underwhelmed when I first completed the campaign, due to just how quick it was to complete and how boring the missions were. Like, come on, I don't want to keep killing the same enemies on these floating Vex platforms over and over again. Number 2, the new content. In this expansion, we got two new strikes, which are just repurposed from the campaign, three crucible maps, one new destination, two new world quests, and a new raid layer. As I said before, the two new strikes are just reused from the campaign, so like, yeah. Out of the three new crucible maps, I think that Pacifica is probably the best. Wormhaven is fine, but if you get a bad lobby, it just makes the map ten times worse. And raiding cliffs is okay. That's the new destination. <laughs> wow, what a cool location. I sure do love how fucking small it is. It is literally just a big circle with a portal at the back. It's so small that there's only one, yes, one, Lost Sector. There's literally nothing to do with this destination except for the world quests and maybe the adventures. Which, did anyone even do these? Like, seriously, did anyone do these? Anyways, back to the actual content. For the world quests, there was Legends Lost which consisted of four missions, and all it gave you was a legendary shotgun and an emblem. Then there was the Dawning Ghost quest line, where you had to complete three verses per week from Brother Vance, until you completed all 11 verses, and you got a ghost shell. Yes, a ghost shell. The new raid layer was Ear of Worlds, and it's kind of mid. The raid consists of Hopscotch, Add Clear, Yes, this is an encounter, Run, then Hide in Corner, Minecraft Furnace, then Shoot with Element, Boss Fight, Done. And finally, wait. Oh, that's everything. All we got for endgame content was just some more PvP maps, which don't even count if you're a pure PvE player, two new quests, which one you complete by just doing activities, and the other just by doing verses from the guy, and the rewards are kind of trash, so yeah. Guess you gotta wait for the next expansion for some more content. A guardian that was thought to be lost named Anna Bray is searching for clues to her past. Her search leads to Mars. When she arrives, war sats begin to crash into the ice. This makes the ice start to thaw, which reveals the core of the Warmind Rasputin. The thawing also frees an ancient hive army that serves the Worm God Zol. The Guardian arrives and helps Anna, and together they stop the Worm God Zol from destroying Rasputin. Now you're probably asking, Derek, why did you not talk about the rest of the story? That was the story. Yes, that Wikipedia level summary is the story. There are only five missions in the whole campaign. And just like Curse of Osiris, two of the missions are strikes. Now I just want to clarify, this is not a criticism towards the campaign. This is a criticism at Bungie's design philosophy. Now I get it, designing missions and strikes is probably really hard, but I personally don't like when missions are just reused as strikes, and vice versa. Especially when the last mission is reused as a strike. Kinda makes the missions feel less special and unique. Again, I'm not counting this as a negative towards the campaign, because this is just a problem that I personally have. Anyways, the campaign is pretty meh. Nothing to say. Although the campaign felt shorter than Curse of Osiris, the only thing that felt weird to me was that our guardian kills a high worm god in like, no time at all. As for the new content, it was actually pretty decent. First of all, the new destination was actually good this time. The layout was nice, and there was actually stuff to do in this destination such as the Override Frequency questline. Basically, you would go to Anna, or Anna, whatever the fuck. Basically, you would go to Anna to get a frequency, and it would give you a clue as to where the Diamond Node was, or whatever that thing is called. You would interact with it, and once you completed enough of them, you would get Sleeper Stimulant, which was a pretty good exotic linear fusion. We also got two new strikes, as I mentioned before, although there was a third strike that came out, but it was PlayStation exclusive, so it doesn't count. As well as two new Crucible maps, we got some quality of life changes, like the emote wheel, private matches, and a vault space increase, which was very much needed. We got a new raid layer, Spire of Stars, which was actually decent compared to Eater of Worlds, even if there were only three encounters. 
Still, to this day, it remains the only raid I have not completed, and if you've played Spire, then you know why. Now for what I consider to be the best thing that came out of Warmind, Escalation Protocol. This is a prime example of a good seasonal activity. Basically, there were seven rounds, each one escalating In difficulty, and each one made you complete different objectives. You could also complete each round with more rewards if you completed the heroic version of the objective, like a public event. Once you reached wave 5 and over, it actually started to get really hard. The final boss that spawned on wave 7 was actually like the hardest thing to beat back then, because if you didn't have at least 5 or 6 people for wave 7, then you were not completing that event. Just to recap, um... Rewards that are specific to the activity. That's right. You made it real hard. In fact, yeah. what was the feedback you got at the summit? <laughs> yeah. So actually, yeah, at the, at the summit, <laughs> uh, they, you know, they were having, they were finding it difficult. But the feedback we got was that they would prefer if it was even more difficult. And we were really close to being locked down, but we managed to squeeze in one final change, specifically based on the community feedback from the summit, mm -hmm. to make it even harder. Yeah. Okay. The the day of the summit, that yeah. right afterwards, Jake and I went back up to our desks and got cranking on making a change yeah. and, and getting all the right channels like involved for it. And mm -hmm. so now it'll be even harder. It's what people asked for. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. There were five bosses, and they changed every week. So one week it would be the Hive Knight, and the next week would be that fucking ogre with the thralls that would heal it by running into it. Oh my fucking god. The loot that was dropped also changed with what boss it was. So sometimes some guns would be available, while sometimes all the guns could be available depending on the boss. And the loot was actually good. I just remember playing Escalation Protocol for like four hours just trying to get the shotgun. The sniper and SMG were also really good, so it really encouraged replaying the event. Especially because Bungie added a new system for the activity. Basically, when you complete the activity, you had like a 1% chance for their guns to drop. However, Every time you did not get a gun, your drop chance went up by 1%. Now you're probably thinking, wow, a 1% drop rate, and I have to go through all 7 waves just to get a chance to get a gun? And if I don't, I have to go through all 7 waves again just to get another chance? Well, yeah. That was a problem at launch, but other than that, this activity was really fun and a decent challenge with great rewards. They did nerf the difficulty over time, however, making the max life for the activity less, and exotics that came out later, like Anarchy, just made Escalation Protocol just not as difficult as before. Still, Escalation Protocol is a prime example of how to do these seasonal activities right. We will come back to Escalation later, but for now, let's move on. When Curse of Osiris came out, everyone thought that Warmind would be the same. I mean, I did, but it wasn't. It actually gave us some really good things. And I'd look back on Warmind fondly due to what it brought and what had come before. Now, on to the next expansion, Forsaken. After you and Cade respond to a jailbreak at the Prison of Elders, Cade gets killed by Aldrin Sov, some guy from the first game. Any last words? How's your sister? <laughs> now you seek revenge. You defeat Ultron's partners and then you kill him. Yeah, I'm skimming over the campaign, but I'm tired of repeating the same stuff about these campaigns. It's fine. That's all I'm gonna say. Until Witch Queen, no campaign really invested in me. But we'll get to that later. Kate's death was emotional, but it could have worked better if, you know, Cade's death wasn't ruined by the marketing. Let's talk about the new stuff. First, we got a new destination, the Tangled Shore, new strikes, exotics, new crucible maps, and a new exotic quest to get the Ace of Spades. But that's not all. But I'm not done yet. Call right now, and I'll triple the offer. We also got the Dreaming City destination with its own strikes, quests, secrets, exotic quests, and the new raid, Last Wish, which is the best raid in Destiny 2. I'm sorry, it just is. Then we got Gambit. I call Gambit. Your fire team's gonna compete with another gang of guardians to see which of you is better at hunting all the enemies of humanity. All right, all right, all right. Let's see what we've got. Which was a good time. It was a fun and interesting new game mode to play. It also had an exotic quest of its own. 
We got so much content and stuff to do that it was insane. We got more content than Curse and Warmind combined. They even added random weapon rolls, finally. Which was so good for replayability. Now, not everything was perfect. The exotic quest for Gambit that gave you Malfeasance was super annoying to complete due to the fact that you had to get a specific boss and kill it. And since the bosses in Gambit were random, it got pretty annoying. And then even after you got the gun, it sucked. Like, really bad. Then there was also that shaders were still consumable, huh? power level mattered in Gambit for some reason, and the Riven encounter in Last Wish was so insanely complicated that people don't even do the encounter the real way, even to this day. Other than that, this expansion was so good. I still believe that this is one of the best expansions we've ever had. Now from here on, Bungie decided to start a new way of releasing content, and that was Seasons. Basically, a new season would come out every three months with its own content and activities, until a new expansion came out. And this looked great. It would solve the content drought problem that we've had whenever a new expansion would come out and there would just be nothing to do after you did everything. The main thing that we want to change with year two of Destiny is that there's never a content drought. There's always something new happening every month, year round. So there's seasonal updates that are free for all players and major content beats as part of the annual pass. The annual pass is a result of our learning and looking over this last year of how people have responded to uh, Osiris and Warmind and the things that they've really they've resonated. Escalation, Escalation protocol, protocols, protocols, yeah. and the hidden quests uh, in Warmind, and the Whisper quest, and a lot of so the three that are, are coming: Black, Black, Black Armory, Joker's Wild, Joker's Wild and Penumbra. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to make something clear. I'm not going to be reviewing every single season. If I did, then this video would be five times as long. If there's something worth talking about in the season, then I'll mention it, but I won't review every single thing that came out for it. With that out of the way, Season of the Outlaw and Forge were fine. Outlaw gave us the first dungeon, which was a three-player mini-raid, and Forge gave us the Scourge of the Past raid, aka the easiest raid ever. Drift Ride didn't play that much, and Opulence was good because of the Menagerie and Crown of Sorrow. Alright, now let's move on to Shadowkeep. A new evil has appeared on the moon. Your guardian responds and finds Eris Morn. She requests that you defeat the nightmares created by the darkness. These nightmares take the forms of different enemies from the past like Crota, Tanix, and Gaul. So you defeat the nightmares and make your way to the pyramid ship that is beneath the moon. When you head inside, your ghost gets corrupted or taken over by the darkness. Side. There's no turning back now. The darkness spouts some nonsense at you before you reach a statue and a cutscene place. One by one, Crota slaughtered many guardians. The light stood by, that did nothing. And a great disaster ensued. Uh. heard your cries for help and soon we will answer who are you don't you recognize us we are not your friend we are not your enemy we are your salvation Yep, that's the end of the campaign. You talk to Eris Morn one more time, and that's it. As if we couldn't go lower, we went from 17 story missions to 8, then 5, now 4 story missions. I remember being so bored throughout the entire campaign, even when playing the endgame content, which consisted of one exotic quest for Deathbringer, which I didn't like because you had to complete 5 memories, 
However, you can only do one a week. Then we got five Crucible maps and the Raid Garden of Salvation, which I played on day one. And then I stopped. I stopped playing the game. I just wasn't having fun. I wasn't engaged. I just didn't want to play anymore. The new dungeon came out a couple weeks later, but I still didn't come back. The Garden of Salvation Raid was the last thing I did in Destiny 2 for quite a while. I went off to go play other games. Like Fortnite. But that's besides the point. The point is, I didn't play Destiny 2 for over 500 days. I did come back when Season of the Splicer came out. So I'm not going to talk about the seasons that came out after Shadowkeep, but before Beyond Light. Although, I will mention that they added a sort of battle pass for every new season, starting with Shadowkeep, that gave things like shaders, emotes, weapons, things like that. Let's just move on to Beyond Light. As you've probably noticed at the beginning of this video, and as I just stated, I didn't play Destiny from Shadowkeep to Season of Splicer, meaning I didn't play Beyond Light at launch. So my experience wasn't the day one experience of Beyond Light, but I've heard that it wasn't great at launch. So real quick, I'm just going to quickly skim through the story and give my thoughts as someone who played Beyond Light at a later date. Hey, so quickly going to interrupt. Um, I was going to replay the Beyond Light campaign for this video because I hadn't played it in a while and I thought, you know, hey, why not? I could get some background footage. I forgot that if you if you bought the campaign on your console or another platform, you don't have it on another platform. So that's great. Um, so yeah, because I bought it on console and if you buy an expansion on console and you switch over to PC, it doesn't transfer. Why why can't why doesn't it transfer? I don't know. That's just another bungee thing. I don't personally see how it would negatively affect the game. Like, oh wow, people who bought the expansion on a console can now play it on PC with all their stuff again and you know, not have to buy it again. And especially when it comes to be on light, because if I go to my thing, I can't use stasis. So if you bought it on console, you just can't use stasis unless you buy it again. Which I think is stupid, you know. Um, it's not like it's not like you know you're lock. It's locking behind like an area or just the campaign. It's locking behind a whole subclass. And you know, as you can see. I have all my stuff on there, I just can't use it. So, yeah. Thanks, Bungie. I really appreciate it. A pyramid ship on Europa has given a fallen named Aramis the powers of stasis. She wants to build her empire with her new powers to take revenge on the Traveler because supposedly it left the fallen and she's upset about it. You start using stasis to defeat Aramis. The campaign ends with Aramis being defeated and frozen. Overall, the campaign's okay. We did get a new element, stasis which was pretty cool, and it was a darkness super. It also gave us some new type of customization with it, where you could pick and choose different statuses or buffs, as well as fragments which could give you a new abilities. Unlike the other elements where you could only really choose your grenade, jump, and three variations. I have heard about how stasis was broken at launch, so that was something. Now we talk about the content, or rather the removal of content. Apparently, Bungie saw that the size of Destiny 2 was getting to over 100 gigabytes, and thought that some things should be removed and that weren't needed to make sure the game wasn't so big. But to deliver these big content beats each and every year, and keep building on top of our seasonal experiences while making technological leaps forward, we also need to make some big changes to the way we treat some of our older legacy content. The fact is, the game is too large to efficiently update and maintain. We're on track to be like 115 gigabytes on PlayStation alone, and our updates to the game are huge, and we're starting to reach the limits of our ability to patch. So instead, here's our plan. Each year, just as a new expansion comes out, we're gonna cycle older, less actively played activity and destination content out of the live game and into what we're calling the Destiny Content Vault, the DCV. Sounds fine. I mean, it's better than having the game get bigger and bigger. It was a good idea. 
So they got rid of 4 destinations, 7 strikes, 2 gambit maps, 11 crucible maps, 7 crucible modes, 5 raids, 16 exotic weapons, 11 exotic cows, the first 3 campaigns, the menagerie, the tribute hall, the black army quests and weapons, and gambit prime. These things would be put into the destiny content vault or DCV aka removed from the game with the possibility of it coming back later. They also sunset a lot of weapons, basically meaning that they are stuck at a max power level no matter what. They'll just always be the same base light. And since most of them are crucible weapons, you can't use them in things like Trials or Iron Banner. And even good PvE weapons you can't use as well. And people were mad. It got so bad that Bungie decided to roll back their idea of sunsetting weapons just six months later. In a blog post on February 25th, 2021, Assistant Game Director Joe Blackburn says, With Season 11, we introduced Infusion Caps. An iteration on Infusion designed to keep Destiny's gear game fresh from release to release and to create a healthy ecosystem for our aspirational content. While we still believe in these goals, it's clear our execution was off the mark. We want the rewards you've earned in Beyond Light and its subsequent seasons to feel like valuable tools you can use in the incredible challenges you'll face in the Witch Queen. So we're making a change. We've made the decision that any weapon or armor that can currently be infused to max power will continue to be able to reach max power permanently. So now we don't have to worry about it. Now back to Beyond Light itself. We got the Deepstone Crypt Raid, which I personally think is pretty neat. As for the seasons, I went back to play Season of the Hunt and Season of the Chosen while Season of the Splicer was still going. I didn't like the Season of the Hunt activity, I thought it was boring as hell. Season of the Chosen was alright. Now Season of the Splicer, however... This morning, for the first time in humanity's long and storied history, the sun did not rise. It's a vex simulation that is Jesus Christ. Night. Fucking For hell, man. I'm finished. Away. Now this is a good season. The activity was fun. The story was good. I really enjoyed it. We also got things like transmog, which was cool. Although you had to do quests to earn synth weave to make one transmog thing. Or you could just pay money. But it was better than nothing. Season of the Lost was good. We also got the 30th anniversary event, which was really good because Witch Queen was delayed. And so instead of having to wait a couple more months with no new content, this felt like a mini expansion to hold us over with a new activity, rewards, and dungeon. So that was really good because I just remember just being like, oh, Witch Queen got delayed, but then 30th anniversary came out and we just had so much new stuff to do. And then Witch Queen finally came out. Before we get into Witch Queen, I think it's important I mention one last thing that Bungie sunset. At the launch of Witch Queen, Forsaken and most of its content would be sunset, meaning the campaign and the Tangled Shore would be vaulted and unable to be played. Forsaken would be turned into the Forsaken Pack, which would cost $20 and give you access to the Last Wish Raid, the Shattered Throne Dungeon, and Forsaken Ciphers which you could use in the tower to purchase the Forsaken Exotics. If you already had Forsaken, then you would just get the ciphers. This means that the money you spent to buy Forsaken originally was basically gone, since most of the content you paid for was removed from the game. This also meant that any future expansions and content you paid for would be removed eventually. And even if you bought the pack, you wouldn't get to experience the campaign. So Forsaken is effectively gone. I think that this was a horrible decision, and later Bungie responded to all the negative feedback. But for now, Let's talk about Witch Queen itself. Wow, did I actually have fun with the Destiny campaign? And the story was good? I never thought this would happen. Before I get into the campaign, I'm gonna need to recap some things. So basically, Osiris returned, but was possessed by Savathun. Using Osiris' body, Savathun was able to gain info. However, she was eventually discovered and offered to return Osiris if Mara removed her worm. This ritual seemingly worked, and Osiris was returned with Savathun gone. Now, onto the start of Witch Queen. Mars has reappeared after being taken by the darkness during the season of the arrivals. Basically, Bungie tried to make an in-universe explanation to why the planets were vaulted. Savathun's hive ship is also on the planet. After boarding, the Guardian finds a hive knight that has a ghost. This is because Savathun stole the light and infused it into her warriors. After entering Savathun's throne world, we are contacted by a hive ghost named Finch. Hey, 
Guardians aren't safe in a place like this. Who is this? Well, that's neat to know, pal, and you don't. Uh, neat to know. I mean, look, just get out before Sabathun and her light-up goons realize you're here. Are you with the Vanguard? Hello? We lost him. I can trace the signal. Any lead's a good lead. We have no leads. Finch has chosen to switch sides to aid us in defeating Savathun. Hey, you know, get awkward out of the way first, I always say. This, uh, pile of ash and bone used to be my, uh... Actually, don't worry about it. All you need to know, us wandering ghosts gave into the hive believing we'd found purpose and, well, peer pressure's a hell of a thing, huh? Also, because it's what the Traveler must have wanted. Yeah. Then Hive killed Guardians with light, and you think, that's the Traveler's will, really? I'll tell you what, I don't buy it. Not anymore. The Witch Queen's up to something, and, you know, maybe together we get to the bottom of it, huh? There's an old Hive temple nearby with Savathun's secrets inside. That is all I know. The what and the why? That's your game, yeah? And when you get there, radio me. Private channels only. Finch gives us info on where to find Segura, Osiris's ghost, who died in Season of the Hunt. So, Finch, mind telling us what exactly it is we're looking for? Oh, you know, uh, uh, what's his name, that old warlock Osiris? Yeah, it's his ghost. Well, was his ghost. Wait, you mean Segura? Th that's the one, yeah. You know what happened to her, how she, mm, you know. Sivu Arath came for her backed her into a corner. But clearly Sabathun found her shell, impersonated Osiris. An old memory is revealed of Sabathun talking about something called the Witness. I stand before a being with a thousand names. It whispers one. The Witness. Remember it. Remember that name. Did anybody else hear that? It sounded like Sabathun. Who's the witness? No clue. I've never heard that name before. Hey, that's exciting though, right? A lead! What's most exciting is that you were telling the truth. After a few more missions of listening to Savathun's memories, we learn that the witness is the pyramid ships that we've seen back in year one, Shadowkeep, and Beyond Light. So basically, the witness is the darkness. Hey, so as I was editing this, I realized that I actually got this wrong. The witness is not the darkness. They just use the darkness. Um, I just wanted to make that clear because I don't want to look stupid. Um, I don't know how late it must have been when I was writing this in the script because I don't know how I got that mixed up. But yeah, the witness is not the darkness. They just use the darkness. So yeah, back to the video. We also learn that Savathun plans to seal the Traveler away in her throne world, which is bad because then we would lose our light and the Traveler would basically be gone forever. I will never be the Taken Queen. I refuse to play second fiddle to my brother Oryx. When Oryx carved the Tablets of Ruin, he described the ability to create the Taken. But Oryx's chisel was affected by viral power from the deep. I studied its vermicular path. I read between the lines. The tablets hide a riddle. The answer to this riddle is something greater than the power to take. It is the power of the witness to move worlds from one reality to another. This is what I will do. I will not take. I will give. I will grant the Traveler a safe haven away from its enemies. And once it hangs in the sky of my throne world, I will seal it away. We then travel to a temple to retrieve a worm that could unlock some more memories to get some more info. However, a vision of an Ahamkara appears, so we have to defeat it and escape. We are unable to enter the Altar of Reflection with the Worm to view the memory, so we have to get a Crystal Shard, which Mara tried to use to trap Savathun during the ritual in Season of the Lost. Your destination lies deep within the Fortress Guardian, in the Apothecary Wing. There you should find a particular Shard of Crystal. You 
might recognize it from Savathun's time in the custody of the Awoken. So this crystal is a piece of her former prison, which means it was likely on her when she stole the light. Yes. My source believes the events leading to her escape are intrinsically linked to the mystery before us now. We grab it and are able to view the memory associated with the shard. Now the world begins to fade. Incredible that I could forget something like that, isn't it? Such a storied life, erased. The light offers us a fresh start. But if we don't know where we came from, how will we know where to go? I'm so grateful to you for reminding me, for telling my story. Wait. What is she talking about? She remembers. We helped her remember. Thanks for the memories, Guardian. We have to leave. And Ikora uses the relic, which I'll get into later, to view a memory with the worm. We are shown that the witness lied to Savathun by stating that the Traveler will bring a cataclysm, causing her to free the Worm Gods which created the Hive in the first place. Now onto the final mission. Savathun is attempting her plan on sealing away the Traveler, so we have to stop her. After Savathun is defeated, she dies while giving us a final warning that the witness is coming. Calculated. So did you, Guardian. 
so protective of your traveler that you wouldn't let me keep it safe. But the witness is coming. The game is yours to play now. Yours to win or lose. Just don't say I didn't warn you. Where did your ghost go? Guardian, I just got the message. The Traveler is back in the last city. Is it done? Is Salvathun... She's dead. But her ghost got away. Good enough. Hold your position. The Hidden are coming to secure the remains. Good work, Guardian. You did the right thing. Now what? Now, we prepare for the witness and stop the next collapse. In the final cutscene, we are shown this fucking tornado head person who turns out to be the witness, getting ready to come and attack the solar system. First of all, I wasn't actually expecting a good story for a Destiny campaign. It had stakes, it was interesting, it had lore drops and twists that made us you know, think. Like, why did the Traveler resurrect Savathun? Or, what is the Witness going to do with the Traveler when it reaches it? Plus, the gameplay was better too. With this campaign, Bungie introduced an option to play the campaign on Legendary. This basically meant that no matter what, every enemy in every mission would be over your light level. So enemies took longer to kill and did more damage. And this was actually fun, because this meant that you couldn't just run through the entire campaign with your brain turned off you had to actually try. Definitely the best addition to the campaign gameplay-wise. It even scaled if you had more players and gave you more loot. We also got the Relic. Basically, if you got five red border weapons, you could unlock the ability to craft that weapon and level it up and make your own god roll. Sounds amazing. And it is, if you don't count actually getting the red border weapons. See, you could play an activity and get a weapon, but it's not red bordered. And even if you get one, you have to get it five times to be able to craft it. So you have to play an activity over and over again to get not just the weapon, but also have it be red bordered, which was pretty annoying. Besides that, we also got a rework for the void subclass, which made it use the system like stasis where you could choose fragments and different buffs. Bungie planned to rework all the base subclasses to use this system over the coming seasons. This also meant that any grenade could be used as any class. The raid Vow of Disciple was good, However, the season that launched with Witch Queen was eh, it was kind of mid. After Season of the Risen, we got Season of the Haunted, which I didn't like because the activity was so boring. The reason why Escalation Protocol worked, see I told you you'd get back to it, is because it actually was challenging and the rewards you got were worth playing the activity over and over and over again to get them. Then we got a new dungeon duality, which was fine. Then we got Season of the Plunder. Are you fucking kidding me? This is the worst season in my opinion. The activities were so boring after like the fifth time you ran them. The story was fine at the beginning where you had to collect relics before Aramis. Oh, by the way, Aramis is now unfrozen due to the witness. But the story just fell off harder than Among Us. I said Among Us. <laughs> but the story just fell off harder than Among Us. And after all the weeks of monotonous activity grinding, what was it for? Fucking Osiris T. I didn't mention it before, but once Osiris was separated from Savathun, he was left in a coma. So, how did Bungie solve this? And how did the season end? I'll just read the Wikipedia summary of the end of the season. <clears throat> At the conclusion of the season, Mithrax begins requesting Guardians to make donations of treasures they have collected across the solar system to help renovate the Elixni Quarter. Upon acquiring sufficient donations, the Guardian then travels to the Elixni Quarter, where renovations have begun. From safety and security upgrades, to new housing, a community garden, and even a town square. 
Meanwhile, Mithrax concludes his research and manages to safely extract Nezarek's essence from the relics into a potion, which Save 14 gives to an unconscious Osiris. Osiris finally awakens from his coma and reunites with Saint as he reveals from Savathun's memories of a secret power hidden away in a city on Neptune. I have nothing else to say, so let's move on to the final season before Lightfall. Season of the Seraph. It was okay. It was mostly used to lead into Lightfall and tease about some secret weapon on Neptune called the Veil that could be used against the Witness. I have a final message for you as well. The Neptunian city in Osiris' visions is real. I do not know its exact location, but it is home to the Veil, an object of immense paracausal power, one that is linked to the Traveler. Hmm, I wonder what it could be. I guess we'll have to wait till Lightfall comes out to find out. Before Lightfall launched, we got a couple of trailers which revealed a new green subclass, which we could use to grapple. Ooh. That looks pretty cool. I can't wait to use that. As well as Callus coming back to fight the Witness. We also got an announcement from Bungie stating that expansions would no longer be sunset at the release of the newest one. This was in response to all the flack that they got for sunsetting Forsaken. The hype was massive and on February 28th, 2023, Lifefall released. <sighs> the Witness has finally arrived, and a tense battle takes place in orbit that you get to watch. The Witness uses the Pyramid Ships to trap the Traveler, leaving it open to do whatever the Witness is trying to do. However, the Witness gets a vision of Neptune and something being on it. Seems like it's the Veil. So they send Callus to go and do what must be done. Callus is now a disciple of the Witness, and now him and his Shadow Legion are heading to Neptune. Callus was the guy who we saw in the Leviathan Raid and in Season of the Haunted, or the duality dungeon if you played that. They found a veil. We board one of the ships as it leaves for Neptune. Osiris also jumped on this ship. Guardian, help Osiris reach the veil before Callus does. After fighting through Cabal, we see a new enemy for the first time since the Scorn. It's called a Tormentor, and honestly they're pretty cool. They focus on melee and try and grab you so that they can do massive damage. They also have a slam that can suppress your ability, so you can't just super them to death and kill them instantly. So, nice job, Bungie. Gold star. Callus is after an artifact on Neptune, the Veil. If the Witness establishes a link with the Veil, it'll be over for the entire system. All of our losses would have been for naught. So now you and Osiris are going to take a Cabal landing ball down to Neptune in which you sit and do nothing. Okay, you are contacted by Rohan and Nimbus. You on the road. Identify yourself. Are you with the invaders? We're guardians from the last city. We're fighting the same enemy. We're here to find something called the Veil. Nimbus and I are a little pent down right now. We'll be there soon. Stay frosty, Kieran. They are Cloud Striders and protect the city of Neomuna. Basically, they're Chrome Surfer Warriors. Apparently, the city has existed on Neptune and no one even knew. We always thought we were the last ones left. Wait until the Vanguard hears about this. We fight our way through Cabal to help Osiris, who is trapped inside one of the Cabal Balls. On our way, we find a strange glowing anomaly. This is Strand. Honestly, best thing to come out of Lightfall. This subclass is broken. You start off with a grapple, and later you can you can get different- <laughs> Dude, my nose is fucking me up. You start off with a grapple, and later you can get different grenades that suspend targets and send out Threadlings to attack enemies. Pro tip, always go with suspend. It stops enemies, and if you make a certain build as a titan, you can basically have infinite suspension. So it's stasis on crack. Back to the campaign. At this point, Strand is too powerful for your body to handle. Your body can't handle this much power. Your vital signs are in the red. 
Osiris gets saved by the Cloud Striders, and we decide to regroup at the Watchtower. You work fast. We don't like to waste time. Oh, good. There isn't a moment to lose. We regroup at the Watchtower. You don't understand. We've got to get to the Vale. I understand what's at stake, like Bearer. Far better than you. Not all of us have lives to spare. Meanwhile, Callus has a talk with the witness. That was mission one. So far, not too bad. Through Osiris three fucking times. So that's five. Then by Ghost, that's six. And then in the Callus Cut. Cool Shut up. I'd do pretty much anything to keep the Vale and the people of Neo Muna safe. Now, you know the Vale's in danger. I know where those big guys are headed. So let's go do some hero stuff. His pursuit of this object, the Veil, is of dire importance. If he gets to it first, urgency is key, Guardian. What? Mission 2. Now we have to go get this Veil. You heard Osiris. We need to get to the Veil before Callus and his Shadow Legion. Let's get in the city. I'll open a radio channel with Nimbus. We collect key cards from enemies and then do a defense sequence that goes on for way too long. doesn't have the veil in its possession already. Are you always this much fun? Fun is not my concern right now. With the amount of power the veil has, I think it can hold its own a little longer. You're a hop skip and a couple rooftops away from the veil, light bearer. What is this veil anyway? They say it's powerful, but we still don't know what it is. Hopefully it gets explained later. We're only on the second mission after all. We defeat the Cabal forces, but we're too late. Too late. They've got the veil. Guardian, I don't. This doesn't feel right. The veil? It's worse than before. Much worse. Ah! My witness. the veil. Well, the area around the veil. It is entombed, so it will take some time to break through and link the relay. Add to that the enemy presence. Yes. We know they are here. A few of souls protectors. Cannot prevent fate. 
You will link the radio mast and see the veil destroyed. The final shape rests upon it. Indeed, my witness. was familiar, only much stronger this time. I feel sick, like I shouldn't be here. We're in this together. Osiris and Nimbus need to hear about this. What? So... Our ghost has gotten possessed by the witness before, but now it can do zoom calls? And what the fuck is the veil? What is the radial mast? And why do we need to stop it from linking with the veil? What the fuck is happening? The only explanation we get for why we can't let the veil be destroyed is because everyone in the cloud arc will die. So, the veil's safe, for now. I don't have an Earth Warlord translation for this, so uh, stick with me. If Callus uses whatever that radial thing is and somehow destroys the veil, well, it's tied directly to our cloud arc and literally all Neomuni. I don't think you need a warlord translation for why that's bad. What's the cloud arc? I'm glad you asked. So basically, everyone on Neomuna is living in a virtual network called the cloud arc, and it's powered by the veil. So we need to stop the veil from being destroyed because of that. But what about this link? What will happen if the radial mass links with the veil? We aren't told. All we know is, that's bad. What about this final shape thing? Oh, whatever. This cloud arc they've constructed fascinates me. It appears to function with the assistance of the veil somehow. Nimbus gave me their report about your attempt to reach our veil. Mission 3. We storm through Kallus' ship to destroy the radial mast. The radial mast is somewhere in Kallus' ship. If you strike swiftly, we can remove it as a threat before it ever reaches the veil. Enter Callus's fortress, find the radial mast, and destroy it. I still can't believe my sensors. Could the radial mast really be a light artifact? There's still a great deal we don't know. What is the radial mast capable of? How will it affect the veil? What is the witness planning? All very good questions but ones that can wait until we've destroyed the radial mast and saved your city. I know what's at stake here, Osiris. We fight in a gauntlet while attempting to destroy the radial mast, and when it seems like we're trapped, Callus's daughter, Keitel, comes to help us. Guardian, your recklessness will be the end of you one day, but not today. Have you come to disappoint me one last time? We'll uh, just show ourselves out. We have no choice but to escape without destroying the radial mast. We return to the watchtower and Osiris has a temper tantrum. I am contemplating your most recent outburst with Strand to see if there are opportunities for improvement. It was out of control. We did the best we could. We need to do better! <laughs> Mission 4. Now we need to stop the Vex from siphoning power from the Cloud Arc. Because the Cloud Arc also powers the city's defenses and the Veil's defenses. So, going directly after Kallus kind of blew up in our feet. We need to be looking at the bigger picture. We want to protect the Veil. We first and foremost need to protect the Cloud Arc. It's our city's network. Our infrastructure. Our people, our defenses, everything depends on it. And what we're doing now is stopping the Vex from siphoning energy from the Cloud Arch reactor. We do that, they'll save the Neomuni are safe. Bing bang boom, Darkerine is under lock. I'm detecting those sources as a concentration of energy coming from a common source. It's got to be the Veil. The Cloud Arch needs a lot of juice. Like we said earlier, it supports all the Neomuni, the city's defenses, and also the Veil's defenses. Once we get that power, we'll have all the backup we need to take back the Veil from Kallus. That's good. We're going to need all the help we can get. This mission's whatever. Kind of a filler mission in my opinion. Mission 5. Since our body can't seem to handle the power of Strand, we decided to start training so we can use it more effectively. 
So we do that. Nothing else to say about this mission. Although I will note, it's kind of stupid how we need training. Even though, like, the first time, you know, we used Strand, we kind of got all the training we needed, but whatever. If Strand is another side of the darkness, how come we've never encountered these sources before? The old bird thinks it's like a deep cloud the veil leaves behind. Mission 6. God, why is my nose fucked up? Right as I want to record. Am I interrupting? Rohan, I've been pondering the Veil's paracausal effects on ghosts. I know I haven't been the easiest guest in your city. Pain is not a hindrance. It simply reminds us we're still breathing. Still fighting. Uh oh, it seems like the Shadow Legion are attempting a link with the Veil. We have to stop them. If it links, then that would be bad. Callus encroaches upon the Veil. The activation of the radial mast is imminent. The Veil is compromised. The Amuna will fall. Then all of Soul will follow. Strand will be our edge against Callus. The Guardian is ready to wield it. I think. Getting delayed. How close are you to the radial mast? Almost there. Remember, the radio mass must be stopped before it forges a connection with the veil. See the veil's enclosure. So get down here! If the radio mass links with the veil, it's all over. You and Rohan are our only hope. Radio mast links with the veil. It's all over. You and Rohan are our only hope. Why do you say it like that? I know. You are our only hope. After fighting through hordes of Shadow Legion, we finally reach the radio mast as it's attempting to link. Rohan buys us some time while we clear out Shadow Legion and figure out a way to stop the radio mast. We decide to use Strand to destroy it, but unfortunately we can't. And Rohan. Fucking exploded. Uh, uh okay then. Oh, bruh. Rohan. He. He chose a Cloud Strider's end. Hey, Guardian. Can you please pick up his core? His core? His core? What is he, Iron Man? I'll need it. Oh, okay. bro. We, <laughs> we just have oh, it now. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. This death scene doesn't work. I could see what they were going for, and it doesn't work. They tried to make a grumpy old man who slowly earns respect for you, and then he sacrifices himself. That could work. Problem, we've only known this guy for like three hours, so the connection isn't there. You can't just kill someone off after we've barely gotten to know them. And we'll get to that. For now, let's just move on. You fear loss, Emperor. You 
fear brings you pain. We know pain. Our purpose is its end. You have no purpose. Because you fear to seek one. That fear is your failure. My failure? My failure? Mission seven. We train more with Strand. Next. Is that a taken blight? The shadow agent are forcing taken into that vex arc. The vex deck uses similar gateways as the cloud arc, which means they could infiltrate the network and gain access to the veil. The cloud arc is built on the energy field produced by the veil. It's resilient, but not impenetrable. A backdoor wouldn't be impossible. Final mission. Now we can finally stop Callus. We must stop Callus from reaching the veil and establishing a link to the traveler. We destroy some AA guns and get to the vault. My forces are rallying, but it will take some time. You're almost at the veil, Guardian. Every moment wasted brings us that much closer to calamity. We defend the vault from hordes of Shadow Legion until. Remember your training. You only have one goal keep them from the veil. To me. You must reach the veil before the Shadow Legion. Do whatever you must to prevent the link. So now we enter the vault to get to the veil. Will Keitel be okay? I have a feeling she can take care of herself. Empress Keitel is buying you time to find the veil before the Shadow Legion. Don't squander this opportunity. According to Neo Mooney lore, the veil is deep beneath the ground. Like, way deep. Whatever you find in there, just keep going downward. That must be the veil. It's massive. I feel a little strange. Don't know how to describe it. It almost gives me the same feeling as the traveler. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Let's press on. I have even more questions now. What does Ghost mean when he says that it feels like the traveler? Is it a part of the Traveler or something? Like, oh my god. It looks like the veil goes even deeper. I'm reading major shockwaves in the vault. The Emperor is smashing through that place. Hurry, Guardian. We'll get them before you. Stay alone. 
We've done it. Callus is no more. You gave him a cabal's end. I'll believe it when I see it for myself. Hey, uh, do you guys feel that? No clue what you're talking about. We're almost at the veil. Hang tight. just happened. So we lost. And now there's a portal to go inside the Traveler. Obviously now we know what this is, but back then... Bro. On day one, this ship made no sense. Neptune is the best and only direction we have. Work with the Cloud Striders. Learn what you can about the Veil. Callus is gone, and the Veil is safe for now. But we beat the campaign, so now I get to complain. What the fuck? We never found out what the veil was or what it did, so why should I care? You can't get me invested in stopping the bad guys from getting something that I don't even know what it is. We didn't learn anything new or interesting. Like, remember in Witch Queen when we had two revelations that made us think? Like, why did the Traveler seem to revive Savathun? Or, wow, so the Witness lied to Savathun which created the Hive in the first place? Nope, nothing like that. And besides, what the fuck is the Witness? Like, as a villain. They're just some monotone figure who wants to accomplish some goal that we don't even know anything about. We don't know their motivations or goals, just that they want to enact the final shape. Like, okay? Why? Is it for power or what? Here, I'll use an example. Thanos. I have to break your neck. Real quick, spoilers for a six-year-old movie, I guess. So in the beginning of Infinity War, 
Thanos is shown to be this ultra strong and powerful guy, and he wants the Infinity Stones to wipe out half the universe which would kill trillions. Okay, seems like a pretty good bad guy motivation for being a bad guy, but there's more to him than that. Later we learn about his philosophy, why he's wiping out half the universe, and why he sees what he's doing as the right thing. Little one, it's a simple calculus. This universe is finite, its resources is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. You don't know that! I'm the only one who knows that. But the witness? I don't know. They act so mysterious and vague that I don't know their motivations, so why should I care? Let's do some examples. Savathun. Why do we need to stop her? Because she wants to seal the Traveler away forever. Why does she want to seal it away? To actually protect the Traveler from the Witness. Aramis. Why do we need to stop her? She wants to destroy the Traveler. Why does she want to destroy the Traveler? Because the Traveler abandoned her people. Now the Witness? Why do we need to stop them? They want to cause the final shape. Okay. Why? I don't know. What is the final shape? Uh... See what I'm saying? Now look. I get that the final shape is supposed to be their big, mysterious plan, but how about you at least tell us what the veil is? That way we have an idea of what we're fighting for and trying to prevent them from getting and why they even want it in the first place. <sighs> the story for this expansion is so bad and we learn so little that not even the lore people knew what the fuck was going on. But the chief example of all of these things, the thing that stands out like a sore thumb amongst all the others, is the Veil. I am the lore guy in this community, with of course exceptions like Mylan and Evaze who also do fantastic stuff, but point being, I am the quote unquote lore daddy, and I can't tell you what the Veil is, because I don't know, they don't explain it in the story. But I have one last thing to mention about the story, and it's not in Lightfall. It's actually in the season that came out with Lightfall. Yes, we are getting to that. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? So remember when Rohan died after we barely knew him for like three hours? Well, they did it again. Amanda becomes an actual player in a season, and we learn her backstory. Then she dies. Like, literally the next week after we learn her backstory. No, I got there later. Same as you. I'm not been paying attention to what these fuckers are talking about. You know our story, but I would very much like to hear yours. Oh my god, please. This is actually gonna be a cutscene. Oh my. Awesome. Let's go 3 FPS cutscene. Jeez, <laughs> it's so laggy! Oh my <laughs> god! Huge. That's all that matters. Bro, what? Uh, oh. I know you want it too. Vengeance. You'll be the first to know when it's time. Okay. When he said that, I was like, damn, I don't really care to be honest. This death came from absolutely nowhere, and I didn't care. Because Amanda hasn't been relevant enough for me to care. As much as I was memeing about K not being funny earlier in this video, at least when he died, I felt something. You know, because he was a character that we got to know and care about for a decent amount of time. Anyways, enough about story, and let's just talk about what new content we got in Lifefall. It's meh. Like I said, Strand is pretty fun. The new destination is fine. The new raid, Root of Nightmares, is boring as fuck. The first two encounters are basically the same thing, just in like different arenas. Planets is okay, and so is the boss fight. But this raid is just so boring to me. Every encounter just feels like I'm playing on autopilot. Okay, well, how about the season? Well, other than the funniest fuck ending, it's fine. After that, we got Season of the Deep. I got tired of the season pretty quickly, but it was all worth it, because we got a cutscene that actually explains the witness and the veil. The witness. You must. Wow. Now, I'm not going to talk about what we learned, because I'm kind of tired of talking about the story stuff. All I'm going to say is that it is so embarrassing 
that we had to wait for five months after Lightfall for a cutscene that actually explains more things in Lightfall in some random season. Next up we got Season of the Witch, which I didn't play at all until the final week to see the ending. So here you go. Alright, recording has started. It is now the 3rd of October, and I am playing the fucking season for the first time. Bruh. I cannot wait. This is going to be so fun, guys. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? Get your ass on, man. Alright, so after... What has it been? Six hours. We finally fucking got to this goddamn point. I'm gonna fucking finish this, I'm gonna go eat, and then I'm probably gonna go to sleep. Oh no! Zivu's calling out the Leviathan Eater! He's been around since Fundament! A real heavy hitter! I'm getting out of here, and you should too! Stick around and you'll end up a grease stain! The fourth Eater of Leviathan! Scourge of the Sky! Okay. Raise my sister's port! And time to be at the good eyes. Run for your eyes! They're about to bomb this place flat! Return to our ritual. And they've got a new Christmas. Oh! Your mastery of spellcraft shall be our salvation. How many did I go out? Get they don't even do that much damage either. Oh my Joking. god. Watch out guys. They're doing a bombardment. Flash, 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 flash. Alright. Eris, I've arranged the transmat. But once she's here, we'll lose containment. We can't go back on this one. One last atrocity. This wasn't the agreement. Zivu is still a threat. Do, Do it. it. You will not have another chance. Finally out of her shell. It looks good on you, honey. I am your ruin. Savathun has not been killed by a hive since she lost her worm. Stored eons of potent lies and deceit. All Sabathun's power, plus the tithes of the Guardians. Eris Morn is the strongest hive there has ever been. What the hell? Hear me, dead things. I let this moment pass unnamed, without song. How she this is the rejection of your sabbath. I don't know, with like a little Fortnite pickaxe? Zivu Araf, agitator. Momentum. What a world, sis, you have built from your conquests. No more. Now and forever, you are banished. I ought. <laughs> but yeah, fucking. That was very epic. I'm so glad I did that. Oh, that was the fuck. This season fucking sucks! Oh my god. <laughs> that was the worst ending I've ever seen, bro. God. That shit stinks. Nothing else to say, so we move on to Season of the Wish, which I haven't played at all. Since Season of the Deep, I have had no motivation to play this game. I don't care anymore. I'm done. Here we are. 
we have finally been caught up to the present of Destiny 2. At the time of me writing this, Bungie will be releasing a new big update called Into the Light in about a week or so. And by the time this video is out, it'll probably already be released. And the final shape will be releasing in a few months. So, do I think the final shape will be good? Eh, I don't know. I want to be excited, but there's just too many things that worry me. Like how in the reveal stream there was nothing really announced that was exciting. What, three new supers and one new enemy? Come on. Plus with the layoffs, Bungie's also working on Marathon, Lightfall's existence. I mean, we're getting a new structure to the seasonal model. What with the whole axe thing? Which I think could be good. It's just I feel like I need more info to decide whether it could be good. But this is it. The final shape is where I draw the line. If it's not good, then I'm done. I'm gonna stop playing Destiny 2 forever. Yeah, I've spent hundreds of dollars on expansions and wasted my time playing this game, but I can't keep playing this game anymore when I don't enjoy it. I've got to realize when to quit. Now look, if you still enjoy Destiny 2, then that's perfectly fine. You may even disagree with everything I've said in this video, and that's okay because you can enjoy what you want to enjoy. This video is just for me to vent and explain why I've fallen out of love for this game and why I've lost my faith in Bungie. I know I didn't talk about things like the PvP, but that's because I mostly play PvE, so I don't really know the ins and outs of why PvP is bad, I just know it's bad. But yeah, I plan to make a review of the final shape when it comes out. That'll probably be my last Destiny 2 video, even if it's good. So yeah, thanks for watching and listening to me rant for an hour and a half. This is my first video like this, so if I got anything wrong, let me know, because I'm not an expert. Hopefully Final Shape is good, and that way I can just waste more time on this game. Later. Hey, so as it turns out, we're not done. So Into the Light released in the time that I was making this video and I was, you know, finishing up the Lightfall portion and everything. And then the conclusion part. And we also got a live stream detailing like new stuff about the final shape. So I just want to record this and just put it here at the end so that, you know, it's all here and you know my thoughts about it. So first things first, Into the Light. I've played it. I think it's fine. I like the new activity. That's pretty much all I got to say. You know, we got returning weapons and things like that. What I mostly want to talk about is just um, the final shape things. So we got Prismatic, a um, new subclass, and it looks kind of crazy. Just being able to just put different subclasses together into one subclass looks crazy. It looks like it'd be a lot of fun. Um, I'm not a PvP player, but I feel like PvP might get destroyed now because of all like this balancing and everything so that might be crazy we also got a new race the dread which i mean they look cool i feel like you know we haven't had we haven't had a new race in like since the scorn so seeing a new race is always good i feel like i personally feel like um they saw, like, how people reacted to, like, the first live stream. Because the first live stream, where they first revealed Final Shape, wasn't really good. Like I said earlier, all they really revealed was, like, one new enemy and, like, three new supers for each class. And, like, a super for each class. So, totaling three supers. And people weren't impressed. And so, I think Bungie went into panic mode. They were like, shit, no one's impressed by what we've shown. And the pre-orders are down, so we gotta delay it, and we gotta cook up something, guys. So, here we are. I, I mean, that, this whole, like, Dread thing and Prismatic thing could have been, you know, the plan from the beginning. But I, personally, I feel like they saw, like, how bad the pre-orders were, and how, like, no one was pre-ordering. And so, they went into panic mode, like, shit, guys, we gotta come up with something, because the pre-orders are really bad, and, you know... No one- no one's really impressed at all, so fuck it, make a new race, let's delay, 
make a new make prismatic screw it because prismatic i mean if you think about it it's literally like they're not creating anything new they're just mashing everything together we also got the new um class item exotics where you could put two exotics into one i also think they said that you could like put like exotics from like other classes and like put them on that exotic i don't know i don't remember but yeah that seems pretty crazy it just seems like they're just saying like fuck it dude we're at the end let's just go crazy fuck balancing that's what i'm getting from this because i mean prismatic with everything and then we're also getting you know the class items and just all that it just feels like they're just saying fuck it to balancing let's just go crazy which i mean i'm all for i mean i'm not a pvp player so balancing doesn't really matter to me i would just have to see how this plays in the pve because you know people are going to create some crazy builds anyways that's just my thoughts i just wanted to lay this out at the end because you know this all came out recently and so you know kind of just want to throw it in there um yeah this is the real end of the video nothing else really to talk about um again thanks for watching and yeah